Hey guys, it's uh, and gals, it's Dr. Bam, and this will be, uh, the, I guess we're calling it Inclement Weather Day video part one for unit two. And so the way these videos work is they kind of last, you know, up to 15 minutes. And so I will break when I feel like um, we're getting close to that point. Um, and I'm just going to work through the concepts that we would have worked through today in class. Um, and start there. So last week we covered um, what it is meant by a person's epigenetic framework. Um, and we also talked through the examples of um, for unit two concept two, um, which looked at your uh, genotype environment correlations, passive, evocative, and active. Um, and so we kind of already talked through those two. So I'm going to start with number three. Um, and we're going to go into each one and kind of come in and out. And so for number three, I ask you um, to go ahead and look at pages 44 through 49. Um, and we are showing Sorry. Um, just as a heads up, I do skip over some of the mitosis and meiosis. I would have covered this in um, <clears throat> in your book because I do feel like that's just kind of giving you some background knowledge on biology. So review that if you need to. Um, the same with recessive and dominant. I felt like most people had that covered for them in high school biology. Just but just remember that we all have recessive genes. For example, I have blue eyes, um, and then there's our dominant genes. Um, so even though both of my parents have brown eyes, which are dominant, they both had a, a big B and a little B for blue, right? Big B for brown, little B for blue, um, and they were both that way. So I still ended up with blue eyes, even though both of my parents have brown eyes, because they had the recessive gene for blue eyes. So remember when we're looking at some of these genetic disorders that we're going to be going back into things linked to uh, recessive and dominant genes. Um, and we have a couple different disorders, categories to choose from. And so um, I'm not going to go much more in depth in this question other than to review the instructions here because I think it's pretty straightforward. But I want you to look. So when we are looking at what should be typical development, we often look at, and I'm sorry if you hear my kids, they're home from school, so they might be screaming in the background. Um, so when we look at typical development, we also need to know what is not typical development and why. Um, so I want you to kind of take just a general look at um, a disorder in each of the categories listed below. First, we have our recessive gene disorder. So this is only created, um, we only see um, when they inherit the gene from both parents. Um, that means that both parents would have to be a carrier for the gene. And so sometimes people don't actually know that they have that um, genetic tendency. Um, and they're just both recessive. So if they meet up with the wrong person and they're both recessive, they have the, the chance of having that um, recessive disorder emerge in a child. Um, and so examples here are sickle cell disorder, sickle cell anemia. <laughs> sickle cell disease. I don't know why I said sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, um, PKU, I'm always bad at saying the actual name for that one, phenyl ketone urea. So we'll go with that. Um, there's probably a, a faster way to say it, but you know, that's going to be a metabolic recessive disorder. Um, Tay-Sachs disease and albinism. Um, I actually had a friend, I had a roommate that had albinism when I was in college. Um, the next series you're going to look at is going to be the autosomal dominant disorders. And so remember, you're going to choose this disorder from the link and just give a short summary of what it is. You may want to look beyond what is in our textbook to, to kind of like sum up what is cystic fibrosis and, and what does it do and what's the condition do. Um, so then the next category is the autosomal dominant disorders that um, in order to have this disorder, the individual needs to only inherit the gene from one of their parents, so it doesn't have to have that recessive combination. Um, and for this, we're looking at Huntington's disease, Tourette's syndrome, and achondroplasia. I'm, I'm doing that one the best that I can. 
Um, and that has to do with um, height primarily um, and, and bone growth resulting in a shortened um, height. Then there are sex link disorders. So these are a little bit more commonly known. Um, and this is typically when there's some type of mutation in one of the genes. Um, so, and, and it's usually the, in this one, the, it is the X gene chromosomes um, getting carrying it. Um, it. You know, they tell us that males are more effective than females because they only possess one of those X chromosomes. So um, the additional X chromosome can help to counter um, that harmful gene. So we have fragile X syndrome, hemophilia, um, which, you know, is the blood clotting issues, um, and Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, as those sex linked link disorders. Um, then we have our chromosomal abnormality. Um, this happens when you get too many or too few in your chromosomes. Um, as the mother ages, these do increase, the risk of these do increase, um, and, and all of that. So, your autosomal chromosomal, autosomal chromosomal disorders include Down syndrome, Trisomy 21, trisomy 9, trisomy 13, and trisomy 18. Um, so Down syndrome, Pama being the best known um, in that category. Then we have the sex-linked chromosomal disorders. Um, this is where it is. Um, when the abnormal in the 23rd pair, the result is a sync sex link chromosomal disorder because that's the one that's determining that um, and there we have uh, Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome and the XYY syndrome and triple X syndrome are all in there so you are going to choose one disorder to look just kind of briefly look into a little more than the others and learn a little bit about one of these disorders. Um, I challenge you to choose one that you're not familiar with and uh, give yourself some of that new lear learning um, and some basic understanding of a different possible genetic um, disease. So that is concept unit two, concept three. Um, you're going to go through those. Um, just brief two to three sentences. Um, one disorder in each of the categories. Okay. So our next is unit two concept four. Um, and this is looking, this question is very kind of straightforward. It's one of our five pointers. And it's how long is the germinal phase? How does it start? And when does it start? Um, so the germinal period is really that first period in our prenatal development. Um, how long it is, is about 14 days. Um, so it lasts from conception. So conception is when the egg and the sperm meet, right, and come together. And it goes until implantation or when the, um, uh, uh, the fertilized egg is now implanting into the lining of the uterus. Um, so it, it's 14, about 14 days long, okay, give or take. Um, and the start of it is going to be when the egg and the sperm, um, when the sperm breaks through the eggs and fertilizes that egg. And it, that stage ends when the egg is, plant, um, when the egg implants itself into the uterus lining. Okay, so that is your first stage, really short, short and quick. Let's go back. And the cure. So the next stage, because remember we're going to have these three periods, so we have the germinal and then we have the embryonic period, is your next stage. Um, and this is going to stop, start where the germinal period ends. So it's going to, um, it's, sorry, I was reading the actual question. So it is going to start when the germinal period ends. So when the, it is fully implanted. Um, in the uh, lining of the uterus 
and and that is um, when it is considered an embryo. So when that implantation has fully occurred, then the multicellular organism prior to that, that ball of floating, duplicating cells, um, is now once upon implantation considered an embryo. Okay, um, so once it is implanted, blood vessels are growing, the placenta is coming together, all of these things, Lots is, a lot is occurring in the embryonic uh, period. Um, but this is also the most fragile period. Um, a lot of times women don't even know they're pregnant. Um, between, they're gonna find out somewhere in here that they're pregnant, probably between here and uh, the nine weeks. Um, the ninth week when the fetal period begins, um, but it's also the most the most common time when um, you know basically the organism fails and um, the body uh, gets rid of it as a failed pregnancy. Um, sometimes women know about it um, if it's towards the end or they're very sensitive in their periods or they they track them very closely, um, and sometimes. Women don't even know that it's occurred. Um, and usually this failure is due to something going wrong in the major process. So like if we were to intervene and 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 try to not have the failure occur, there's probably some, some reason the failure of the body was saying that th this isn't gonna work, something's going on. Um, so, but we do see some development occurring in this stage, the head develops and it's, it's, he's kind of looking like a little, um, he or she is kind of looking like a little, um, they always remind me of the little frogs, um, right? And they even, at this point, we, the gills are there and all of that. Um, and so we haven't developed out um, as much as as much as we will within the, the fetal period, but it, there we are starting to see formation uh, parts of the bodies and the head and the eyes and all of that. Okay. But the next stage is the embryo. When, when is it considered an embryo? As soon as it has been fully implanted. So right at that stage. Okay, I'm going to try to get in um, this last little piece. And I actually made another support video on it. Um, but I'm just going to try to cover it really quick here as well. So I encourage you to go back and look at that video if you need more detail. Because I'm sure it has more detail than I'm going to provide right now. So uh, it asks, what does it mean that when prenatal development occurs in a cephalocaudal and proximal distal um, development? And I actually forgot a T in there, so I'll go back and add that in. Um, and this terminology is going to come back um, postnatal as well. Um, we use this, terminal, this terminology both prenatal and postnatal. And simply, cephalocaudal means that um, our these are directions of development. Our cephalocaudal tells us that our body is going to focus on developing head to tail first, and then it is going to be proximal. Do you know? So think about it. It's going to focus on the brain, the head, everything that's going on there. Very important to our senses and overall well-being, right? And our legs, and at this point, it really is a tail. So, in um, when we say post, it's going to be to, through our legs, feet, toes, um, fingers, things like that. Um, but we're going to, um, in this, where they're at in development, it's actually, we're still tail. We haven't divided out into legs. Um, and so, um, it's going to go from our head to our tail first, um, focusing on the primary things that are going to, you know, keep the body functioning and keep it, keep things functioning. And then it's going to go inward, outward, same thing. So it's going to focus on those major organs development first, and then go out, um, you know, to our fingernails and our, um, fingers and digits and all of that. Um, and so we see that in this prenatal, we'll talk about it postnatal, but it's the same thing. They're going to, you know, work on their, um, fine motor before they're going to do large motor movement before they do fine motor mo movement, because this type of de development, um, continues throughout, um, our, our first couple years of life. Um, so once again, your soft leocaudal development means that we are developing from head to tail first. Um, and then proximal distal is from the internal to the external. And this is important because that makes the weeks where um, we might not know we're pregnant so critical in development because it's really developing those major things first, the brain, the organs, and all of that. Um, and so that's going to come into play in our next discussion regarding teratogens. So um, this is going to end video one, and I'll see you in video two.